आजकल यू मस्ट हर्ड दिस स्टोरी की भीष्मा वॉज ऑल्सो वेरी क्रूअल एंड ही किल्ड द फैमिली ऑफ शकुनी हैव यू हर्ड दैट स्टोरी और फिर शकुनी ने उनके पिताजी के हड्डियों से पासे बनाए और अपने पैर में छुरा भोग दिया टू बिकम लंगड़ा एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट सो ही लेवर फर्गेट नो भीष्मा वॉज नॉट लाइक दैट हु विल गो अराउंड किलिंग पीपल ऑन विम एब्सोल्यूटली नॉट इन फैक्ट इवन इन शांति पर्व ही टेल्स दैट फिजिकल पनिशमेंट मृत्यु दंड शुड बी द रेरेस्ट ऑफ द रेयर दिस प्रिंसिपल ऑफ मृत्यु दंड बींग रेरेस्ट ऑफ द रेयर वी कैन ट्रेज इट बैक to mahabharat and to our shastras yeah and he also says that um, basically any kind of punishment has to be yathartha not out of a whim and he's never acted out of the whim so that is the reason he's one of the greatest characters in mahabharat hindu rehna hai to decolonize to hona hi padega we need decolonization for mahabharat we definitely need decolonization on a chilly january evening to have a uh, audience like this awaiting since 10 in morning i mean what the panel speaks for itself it needs no introduction thank you so much everyone to kindly patiently being here for us i must also thank the organizers and the college authorities for allowing us permission to have conversation like these uh, in the very heart of university of delhi in a college which has a legacy of producing brilliant minds erudite scholars each year thank you so much to begin the discussion um, as i was reading the book the last couple of days i sort of found myself in the very amidst of the rich itihas that bharat has always been famous for i could see what ami was aiming to and uh, i would seriously like to uh, confess the fact that she delivers what the readers are looking forward to it is a must read in the very beginning that is what i'm looking for to begin this conversation i very humbly ask our much celebrated author ami uh, the the reason of writing the part 2 the fact that what all needs to be reset retold rearticulated that compelled you to write the second part of the much celebrated mahabharat unraveled part 1 and also when you read the text why did you choose to make bhishma pitama as the epicenter of the dharm discourse post war so if you could just answer that question so why mahabharat unraveled 2 why did i need a second part and why bhishma so पहली बुक जब लिखी महाभारत अनराबल्ड वन आई वॉज सीरियसली नॉट इवन श्योर इफ एनी बड़ी वॉज गोन टू रीड इट बिकॉज आई रिमेंबर प्रवीण हु वॉज द पब्लिशर एट दैट टाइम टेल मी कि आप लिखो एंड आई वॉज लाइक अच्छा लिख तो दूंगी पर पढ़ेगा कौन एंड ही इज लाइक नहीं नहीं आप लिखो नो बडी रियली नोज वॉट वेद व्यास जी इज महाभारत हैज सो गिव इट अ शॉर्ट सो लिख तो दी एंड देन you know when the when the book comes out and especially if it's a, if it's your first book you're very very scared you're very nervous at least i was and then i said i did not plan to write this krishna made it happen and he'll see who reads it not my problem so the second one is also just krishna krupa now just that i have more confidence now ki bhai log pad rahe hain to why not so thanks to all of you that this book has happened um the first one talks about the key characters it talks about the stories and the idea of the first one was that वैसे महाभारत तो सबको पता है but there are lots of myths that um that are in in vogue about mahabharat um myths to theek hai but the issue was that it leads to a lot of propaganda right propaganda about how do we see our past there were words like misogyny casteist ye sab there were so many such words thrown around and our itihas was used to justify it so the idea of the first two books was to set the narrative straight for what the itihas was however mahabharat has a lot more than just the story of our ancestors it is also called a uh, dharma shastra it has lots of uh, very very profound discourses as conversations between people which is the most famous conversation discourse absolutely the bhagavad gita but bhagavad gita is not covered in this book it requires i think bhagavad gita pe likhne ke liye aukat chahiye and it's the 
not there yet very humble of you to say that very humble uh however there are many other discourses like shanti parva shanti parva which is the largest uh, sarga parva of uh, mahabharat which is an interesting conversation between yudhishthira and bhishma so this is after the war the war is over and uh, bhishma pitama is lying on the bed of arrows and yudhishthira is struck with this guilt intense guilt about whatever has happened lots of destruction has happened after the war and at that time krishna suggests he says that why don't you go to bhishma pitama he let him do his deha tyag soon enough but bhishma pitama has immense knowledge collected from him and that is when the whole discourse happens so that part is in shanti parva it has lots of uh, topics covered um, it has lots of philosophy covered but the the most important part and most relevant from today's context was what is raj dharma and raj dharma is of course the dharma for a raja but then is it relevant today is the question because at the end of the day a raja is the one who administers who governs right but a leader of an organization is also that he also has to take different kinds of decisions for all the stakeholders which also the raja has been doing right what shanti parva does and it builds on the smriti shastras that we've already had it talks about what is the um, as i said the dharma of a raja and he says lok ranjanam evatra raj dharma sanatana ragnya nam dharma sanatana lok ranjanam welfare delight of the people delight of your people how do you ensure that happens right today also what do we talk about in organizations customer satisfaction employee delight it's exactly the same thing and then he goes into the details of different aspects of administration governance and all of that yeah and you will read in detail in the book i'm not going into uh, the different aspects of it but he also talks about geopolitics he talks about how taxation should happen he talks about how should security internal and ex external security this should be taken care of uh, when he talks about treasury he has uh, and justice in fact both together he says that for certain crimes you don't have to give physical punishment you should uh, you should uh, impose penalties okay but while saying you should impose penalties he also says something very interesting he says these penalties shouldn't become a medium to expand your treasury and i specifically wanted to talk about that in delhi because i remember a um, few months ago i was you know one of these ola cabs aur koi to unko rok raha tha you know there are lots of these people standing around in delhi um, and this guy just sped by and i'm like kya hua aap aise kyu kar rahe ho to he's like ha ha bahut thulle laga rakhe hain kyunki un sabko um, uh, target diya jata hai din ka yeah so that target then ka is basically to expand the treasury use these fines as one of the ways to grow your, or rather fill your treasury and of course we know what else happens so while penalty is definitely one of the go tos which bhishma recommends but he also puts these caveats and he puts these caveats in, on most of the things that he's talking about uh, so if you see the overall principle behind what he's talking about raj dharma is that of course the raja has to do all that he needs to do but what is the pivot the pivot is the uh, is a compassion towards your praja and in that he says how should a raja rule it is like a pregnant mother now look at the analogy he gives like a pregnant mother anybody can tell me why would he say like a pregnant mother any idea ki wo raja ki baat kar rahe hain और गर्भवती स्त्री की क्यों बात कर रहे हैं चाइल्ड एंड हाउ यू सी वेन अ लेडी इज प्रेगनेंट एंड शी मे लव कॉफी नौ महीने वो कॉफी छोड़ देंगे उनको कहेंगे कि वैसे तो सुबह उठ के कांट लिव विदाउट कॉफी कांट वेक अप विदाउट कॉफी बट वेन शी इज प्रेगनेंट जस्ट बिकॉज ऑफ दैट बच्चा शी विल गिव अप एवरी थिंग एंड दैट इज द अंडरलाइंग प्रिंसिपल ऑफ राजधर्म प्रजा सर्वोपरि whatever needs to be done for the praja needs to be done so this comes in shanti parva and i mean it's very detailed i think a lot of first principles which are relevant even in our day to day uh, dealings in our organizations but apart from that there is something called as vidur niti where vidur vidur is a great has a great um, understanding of people 
and he talks about his observations about people how do you how do you observe people what do you learn from them and how do you be careful of certain kinds of people so it's very detailed in that sense it's it's almost like a note on leadership and dealing with people uh then there are many other short stories that i have taken but one of them is called vyadha geeta i'll mention that and answer the bhishma question and then probably stop vyadha geeta so vyadha is a hunter or a meat seller so in vyadha geeta the meat seller is giving a discourse on dharma to a brahman and this is for the first time you read it you're like oh wow but they always told us we are a caste society right and it was always oppression and oppression went only one way this is always what we are taught but here the lesson of dharma is being taught by a meat seller again a meat seller आजकल तो देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ दिस कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी ऑन श्री राम मीट खाते थे नहीं खाते थे एंड पीपल आर गेटिंग ऑल ट्रिगर्ड अबाउट इट राइट बट यूर अ मीट सेलर इज एक्चुअली टीचिंग धर्म टू अ ब्राह्मण एंड द ब्राह्मण इज वेरी हम्बली सीकिंग इट इनफैक्ट ही गोज टू द मीट सेलर टू गेट द लेसन ऑन ऑन धर्म या सो इट्स अ वेरी ब्यूटिफुल डिस्कोर्स ऑन धर्म एंड आई वुड रिकमेंड ऑल ऑफ यू टू रीड इट इवन इफ नॉट फ्रॉम द बुक जस्ट गो बैक एंड लुक अप दैट चैप्टर and there are many other things which i don't not getting into the detail but why bhishma in shanti parva so it's not uh, i have not made him the pivot mahabharat has him as the pivot and krishna has recommended his name to yudhishthir ki bhai aap inse seekho because there is nobody alive who is as learned and as experienced as bhishma why is that so we all know that bhishma pitama ki pratigya where he was supposed to be the raja right but what happened his father fell in love with a fisher woman and then he said ki aajivan brahmacharya and i will never become the raja but see how destiny works he was not he he did not get the position of a raja but if you see his life immediately afterwards his father passed away the satyavati's kids were very very young so who was taking care of um uh, hastinapur it was bhishma after the brothers his step brothers grew up vichitravirya chitrangad they also passed away very quickly and in quick succession so who was taking care who caretaker pradhan mantri he was always the caretaker raja in that sense right till pandu became the king then pandu also passed away then dhritarash who was blind of course by then vidur was there but still a lot of administrative work was with bhishma there was nobody who understood dharma who understood raj dharma who understood policy making and who understood even the scriptures like bhishma did and that is why krishna asked uh, yudhishthir ki aap inse seekho there is a lot to learn from him so go learn from him so that is one and aajkal you must have heard this story bhai ki bhishma was also very cruel and he killed the family of shakuni have you heard that story aur phir shakuni ne unke pitaji ke haddiyon se paase banaye aur apne pair mein chura bhog diya to become langda and all of that so he never forget no bhishma was not like that who will go around killing people on whim absolutely not in fact even in shanti parva he tells that physical punishment mrityu danda should be the rarest of the rare this principle of mrityu danda being rarest of the rare we can trace it back to mahabharat and to our shastras yeah and he also says that um, basically any kind of punishment has to be yathartha not out of a whim and he's never acted out of the whim so that is the reason he's one of the greatest characters in mahabharat that's it thank you very well said of course one had to send you just had to seek all that knowledge and wisdom uh, from um, dying grandfather of his he had all the time in the world but you know one had to seek as much as one could and uh, as you rightly pointed out that the practicality of the raj dharma which is being pointed out in this particular book one also sees that there is an echo of similar things being said in um, chanakya zarta shastra for that matter and at this point i would like to bring sanjeev sir in the conversation and i'll ask him if he sees that there are a little resemblance that is being exhibited by the arthashastra for that matter or by extension of course in a little different context and a different world view 
Uh, does one also place Niccolo Machiavelli as the prince? I suppose Delhi University students, a lot of literature students read the prince in their texts and they read in between the lines and they find these resonances. So if you could just unwrap that for us, sir. India has a long history about uh, thinking about governance and those kinds of issues. Uh, Arthashastra, of course, is uh, Cortelier Arthashastra is the most famous, but in fact, this is a much longer history. By the time Cortelier writes this, uh, writes the Arthashastra in the third century BC, a lot of debate has already happened uh, in India. And so, even in the Arthashastra, he is quoting uh, other uh, uh, great scholars who came before him, uh, particularly Shukracharya, Brihaspati, and so on. But since we are here to discuss the epics, let me say the epics also have uh, various ways of thinking about uh, governance. And in fact, uh, they give us a very interesting insight into how we thought about governance right from the very beginning. So the Vedic texts, by the way, are mm, very difficult to pull out uh, principles of governance from them. We know vaguely about that there was uh, some sort of a chief council, uh, maybe even republic type institutions in the Sabha and the Samiti and so on. But we don't know exactly what are the principles they use for governance. So, but the epics, you begin to see this for the first time. And what is the central problem that Indian economic and governance uh, thinking is trying to resolve for? They are trying to resolve for a problem called Matsya Nyaya. Now, this is very important to understand this concept, Matsya Nyaya. Matsya Nyaya literally means the law of the fish, in which the big fish eats the small fish. You can call it the law of the jungle, so to speak. And essentially, the state exists in order to keep an abeyance Matsya Nyaya. So, if you don't have a dharma and a state based on dharma, you will have Matsya Nyaya. However, the conception of what constitutes Raj Dharma and how to ensure that Matsya Nyaya does not impinge upon governance uh, evolves over time. So the Ramayana, by the way, is the earlier of the two and it has a particular and peculiar view of Raj Dharma. Basically, at the stage of the Ramayana, the idea is Matsya Nyaya is held in abeyance by essentially ensuring that contracts are enforced and the laws are obeyed and even the ruler obeys all the laws. So that is the main point, one of the main points of the Ramayana. So you see, for example, Sri Ram is repeatedly having to follow rules or even enforce contracts on himself sometimes, keep promises, including the ones that are unfair. So the ones that are fair and easy to do are okay. But one of the points of the Ramayana is that even unfair laws have to be enforced and even the king has to enforce them. So Ram, by the way, is at the receiving end throughout this, of all of this. He has to uh, go on this exile because of an unfair promise his father had made. Ramayana does not try to justify this. Uh, similarly, it is also interesting what is excluded from it. The law of the jungle means that the animals are excluded. What makes humans humans is the fact that they have this civilization based on these laws. So when he kills Vali through what others would consider as being trickery, it is outside of the law because he is an animal. That's what is the, his explanation in, the, in Valmiki's Ramayana. So what makes human civilization civilized, i.e. those who are Aryas are those who are within the civilization as opposed to the Mlitchas, they are those who follow the rules and impose it on themselves. Now there is an obvious problem with this because by the time the Mahabharata is being written, people are saying that, look, it is not leading to happy necessarily to happy outcomes. So the Mahabharata actually ends up making the opposite case. In the Mahabharata, you have Yudhishthir, who like Ram, by, by the way, tries to follow all the rules. Right? In Ramayana, what happens? What is Ram Rajya? Ram Rajya is not, um, you know, a, a utopia. It's not the kingdom of God in the Abrahamic sense. It is simply the place where the ruler applies the laws to himself or herself. In fact, an entire new 
section, the Uttar Ramayan is added to the Ramayan to make the point that Ram was willing to apply the laws to Sita and himself, consequently, and lives his life in misery because that's what the law said. Now it's against natural justice. Right? The Mahabharat comes back and says that no, we need to add here. So you can see the evolution of thought that we need to add a concept of national ju natural justice. So here, Yudhishthir like Ram follows all the laws, but it doesn't lead to happy outcomes. So what do you need? You need a conception of natural, ju natural justice. And you have Vishnu who comes back as another avatar, as Krishna, and look at what he does. He keeps breaking all the laws or interpreting them in, a, in very creative ways. Totally different from Ram. But what is he doing? At every stage, he has a conception of natural justice being served. So if Draupadi is brought to the court, she is disrobed. But the law says that there is no rule about how long the sari is going to be. So Krishna interprets it in a particular way and makes the sari infinitely long. Right? Similar things happens with, you know, Arjun wants to avenge the death of Abhimanyu. So what happens? He can, he can avenge the death, but only as long as the sun is up. So Krishna arranges for, the, for utter darkness to happen with clouds, and suddenly the clouds move away, and the sun, sun, sunlight comes back. So what is he doing? He's repeatedly, creatively interpreting the law to serve some conception of natural justice. Now, so it's very interesting that there is this debate about natural justice and the word of the law. And by the way, this debate is still going on. Sai probably has to deal with it all the time. <laughs> but what I am trying to say here is that there are difficult unresolved issues. The debate between the Ramayana and the Mahabharata hasn't been resolved. But many people don't realize that there is this interesting debate and evolution that is going on. And of course, and I'll talk about, I've talked long enough, let me bring Sai into the conversation. But I'll talk about how many of these things then end up also in the way the Kautilya is thinking about dharma and so on. Yeah, uh, definitely very well put, sir. And uh, as our conversation is progressing, I suppose everyone in the audience will also agree that texts like these and books like these, it is very well established how important they are in today's discourse and today's day and time. And there is no doubt or no second thought to be put what important things lies in the pages of these books. And it, it is at this point that I would like to uh, bring in to Sai uh, Deepak sir and ask him this very pertinent question that uh, the fact that these texts also can anchor the decolonizing of the Indian mind, the much required decolonizing and you being the expert on the decolonizing subject, I propose this question to you sir. Let me start with an example of what happened today and then I'll, I'll relate it to the point that Mr. Sanyal was making. So in the morning I happened to uh, argue before the Delhi High Court in a pharmaceutical case. I'll give you what example, I'll just explain the case in very brief so that you can understand where this argument is going, the drift of it. I represent a certain pharmaceutical entity which used to manufacture a certain drug, let's call it the composition of the drug is C. Under the law, as we have it today, there are mechanisms to control the prices of drugs so that pharmaceutical companies don't extract more than they're supposed to. So year over year, they're allowed a maximum increase of 10% of the price of the drugs, which is called a non-scheduled drug. So what this person does is that he gets an approval for C. The next year what he does is that he changes the composition to E. The brand is retained, but the composition has changed and the price has increased more than 10%, which is permissible under the law. 10% is what is permissible. He's increased to more than 10%. Now there is a rule under the drug regulatory framework saying, if the increase is more than 10%, then the drug regulatory authority shall have the power to penalize you for this transgression period. But on what basis? Transgression will be penalized on the basis of 10% calculated on the same drug for the previous 12 months. So the question is, brand is the same, composition has changed, price has increased, is it the same drug? That's the question. 
Now, intuitively, your conscience will tell you, "Kuch to lafda hua hai yahan pe." That is your your conscience kicking in. But the first thing that they tell you when they enter the legal profession is, "Natural morals and morality are not the same as legal morality or legal ethics." सवाल सिर्फ ये है जिस रूल में इसकी बात हो रखी है डज इट स्पीक ऑफ द सेम कॉम्पोजिशन और अ डिफरेंट कॉम्पोजिशन सो बेसिकली आई हैड टू सबमिट बिकॉज द कोर्ट वाज राइट एंड सेइंग यू रियली थिंक दिस इज राइट आई हैड टू से मिला आई हैव टू गो बैक टू द फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ लीगल जूरिस प्रोडेंस द क्वेश्चन इज नॉट वेदर इट्स राइट द क्वेश्चन इज वेदर इट इज लीगल दैट्स इट ओके व्हिच इज देन यू आस्क योरसेल्फ द सिंपल क्वेश्चन इफ द प्रोविजन सेज that the comparison for increase in the price is only the drug of the same composition and the composition has changed you are penalizing on the basis of the same composition and the price comparison between the previous year and the next year not on the basis of the same brand being sold now this i think finally resonated with the bench and the matter has been put for a different day altogether this is to point out what mr sanyal was pointing out or mr sanjeev sanyal was pointing out that morals ethics natural justice and laws don't always go hand in hand they invariably in court it actually goes a different path altogether since both of them have laid such a fantastic prishtabhumi let me stand uh, on the shoulders of their responses to answer your question because decoloniality and decolonization has become an extremely controversial topic for right as well as wrong reasons i am not the pioneer of the concept the person who's written on decolonizing the hindu mind is sitting before you dr cohen radenst as an intellectual property lawyer i don't get to take credit for what i've not done the point is sometimes in popular discourse expertise and let's say pioneership get conflated i don't want that to happen and i certainly don't claim expertise in the subject perhaps uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to bust a few myths so let me just take my time to answer this question considering that decoloniality and decolonization equally features in the in the arguments in the discourse of the american left and the far left and that's the very same logic being used in the context of palestine and israel at this point questions are being put to me don't you think the very same concept can come back to haunt us and affect us particularly in an indian context when the aryan dravidian theory is deeply rooted in our political discourse social discourse and the reservation discourse especially in the state of tamil nadu right let me answer this differently decoloniality as a term till lene gaya i don't care i don't care for the word at all i am interested in the concept because a certain word after a certain point of time acquires connotations because of its historical trajectory i am more interested in the saransh of it in the bhav of it what is the issue what are the facts we have suffered colonization yes okay the fact that we are all dressed in a certain way and speak in a certain way in a certain language should be decently attributable to the factum of colonization yes or no yes okay did the person who colonized us did did he do it with good intentions according to you the answer is a no surely that means there is a vikruti in your head which is a consequence of his brainwashing and indoctrination through his education and other structures right that also means the the heen bhavna that you have when you look at your own society is significantly attributable to the education that you have been conditioned by so i am merely saying let us remove those layers as much as possible without adopting an isolationist position and ask how much of justice or injustice we do when we speak of our own societies and what not now does it mean that you say that you use colonization as this hail mary pass to pixelate and airbrush everything that was right or wrong with us no not at all after all every society evolves it makes its mistakes i am only saying even when you look at your mistake understand the mistake from a bhartiya perspective and look for bhartiya solutions as opposed to blaming every social evil that your society was plagued with and laying it at the doors of the colonizer that is the simple argument please follow the debate that's going around in the context of jati varna and caste and you'll understand where these points are coming from because this is going to animate the conversation for the next 15 20 years it's going to be extremely crucial i don't want this conversation to be mired in let's say word play as opposed to focusing on the principle of what is being said 
Why is Ami's work important? Why is Mr. Sanyal's work so important? Because you're revisiting history which you have accepted as truism for generations. In the South, N.T. Rama Rao, who is the equivalent of MGR in Tamil Nadu, in some ways, I don't know who wants to call whom as the equivalent because I don't want to get into the fight between the Telugus and the Tamils. I share both identities in several ways. He is known for having played several Aetihasic characters and even Puranic characters, there, there being a distinction between Puranas and Aetihasas. He is known for playing the role of Krishna and the other thing that he is known for playing is Karna. So when you speak to people who come from that part of the country, their understanding of Karna and his life is based on NTR's representation on the big screen than the book itself. And NTR launched that movie before he launched the Telugu Desam party. So he needed to reach out to a constituency, a larger base. And that is not possible in Indian society without actually addressing one of the most central, crucial, arithmetical considerations for electoral calculus, namely Jati. <laughs> so he had to reach out to a certain base. So uh, a narrative about Karna was weaved and created. That is one aspect. That is in the south of Vindhyas. In the north of Vindhyas, who contributed to this? A series that I watched 11 times, B.R. Chopra's Mahabharat, where Pankaj Dhir plays the role of Karna. Significantly valorized, chastised just a bit for his transgressions. The problem is that it is still a huge barrier in telling people that most of the time when we look at something, it is the colonial lens that we apply. It may not be bad in itself provided you are aware of it and you decide that this is the lens I will choose to look at my own society for so and so, so and so reasons. But as long as you're in a bubble in a cocoon where you don't even know this is the problem, I've compared coloniality with the matrix. You don't know that this is where the matrix is, that it exists. I just want you to unplug from the matrix, ask yourself whether you want the red pill, the blue pill or even worse, the black pill. Hmm. That's for you to decide. So. Itihasa at this point requires decolonization because Indology for the better part of its history, modern history, is the product of Christian, Protestant, Evangelical lens looking at Hindu history and it has suffered those distortions from every perspective, Jati, gender, what not. That coupled with the even bigger villain, the homegrown villain, the Indian Marxist, they have completely finished whatever was left of Indian historiography until people like Sitaram Goel, Ram Swaroop, their Shishya Shri, uh, Dr. Konrad Elst, Mr. S uh, Mr. S uh, Sanyal, Mr. Sampat, uh, Dr. Meenakshi Jain, each of them have come out. To put it in the language of the Prime Minister, Abhi to gatte bhare hai, ya phir unka identification hua hai, rod to lena abhi abhi bharna baki hai. There is a huge path ahead. Take it from me, and I say this now, I'll drop the B word here, the good B word. As a Tamil Brahmin coming from Tamil Nadu and who's grown up for the better part of his life in, in undivided Andhra Pradesh, the problem of distortion of history is playing itself out every day and that will continue as long as that poisonous venomous seed called Dravidianism is continued to flourish in Indian political soil. It is not an archival study. It is not an archival study. It is a problem of the present, a continuing problem. The difference between post-colonialism and coloniality or decoloniality, which people don't get. Post-colonialism thinks of colonialism as a matter of past, whereas coloniality sees colonialism as a matter of continuing present in different ways, in our power structures, in education structures and whatnot. Sure, this sounds like the language of the left. Now, this is the problem. The moment you start choosing between the right and the left in the Indian discourse, you are not being Bharati according to me under any circumstances because we have a very different approach altogether. We are equally comfortable being pre-huggers as we are when we worship Lakshmi and we don't see a dissonance between both because we don't subscribe to dehumanizing class struggles nor do we subscribe to abusive capitalism. We need both. That's why we speak of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha which is the perfect balance of everything. So I will not take any further time. Read Ami's works for something else and I'll, I'll, I'll actually steal an anecdote from her life which happened, which she narrated to me in a conversation. 
So she happens to go to IIT Kharagpur, and that's one of the places I think I wanted to point out to Mr. Sanyal, which has the Hijli Jail, where again revolutionaries were hanged. One of the few places, perhaps, where the Nehruvian government chose not to come down with a heavy hammer to kill that particular, uh, let's say, jail altogether. But actually, he converted into an IIT. Yes, it was converted into an IIT. himself did, actually. Correct. So, so she goes to IIT Kharagpur, I think it was last year, for uh, the, uh, one of the IKS seminars, the Indic Knowledge System seminars. I don't want to name the person because I don't want to talk about people, I'm talking about a mindset, so I don't see the point in dropping people's names. One of the funders of that particular event comes from America. He is also someone who has significantly contributed to the establishment of an institution or a department in IIT Kharagpur. So during the course of an informal chat, she is asked, what does she do? What is she here for? Or what was she there for? And she says, I'm here to discuss uh, these books and this is what I've written. Mahabharat Ramayana, who is reading today? What is happening? Where is the money? Where is the What is this? Where is the this is a person who's lived in America for the last 30, 40 years. He's a product of IIT Kharagpur. His entire family has moved there. So I can understand a certain bit of Anglicization or whatever you call it now, or Americanization. Okay, but I'll tell you how she made Mahabharat cool or Ramayana cool. She said, I am qualified from IIM Ahmedabad and Mahabharat became cool. <laughs> so you need a degree from IIM Ahmedabad to make the reading and the dissemination of Bharatiya Itihasas and epics cool, shameful. That is why decolonization is crucial. That's the point. You need someone speaking in Thames River bed, crisp cutting English to push your point on Bharatiya Itihasas. Ajib Vishwaguru hai bhai ye to. ये कैसा गुरु है जो अपने आप से सीखना नहीं चाहता है और आप दुनिया को क्या सिखाएंगे अंग्रेजी में बात करना वो तो ऑलरेडी जानते हैं आप तो डुप्लिकेट है वो तो असली से सीखेंगे सो डीकॉलोनाइजेशन इज लेस अबाउट अ पॉलिटिकल बैटल इट इज एक्चुअली अ पर्सनल बैटल एट एवरी स्टेज वेयर एवरी हिंदू हैज टू आस्क हिमसेल्फ व्हाट एम आई एग्जैक्टली मेरा परिचय क्या है नॉट पहचान परिचय क्या है वेर डू आई कम फ्रॉम आई गो देर समबडी से सवर्णा कास्टिस्ट समबडी एल्स विल से यू एक्चुअली वर्शिप पेट्रियार्कल मेसोजिस्टिक गॉड नो वेर इज माई आइडेंटिटी फ्री ऑफ चार्ज और अटैक्स डी कॉलोनाइजेशन इज नॉट एन अकेडमिक स्टडी फॉर हिंदू हिंदू रहना है तो डी कॉलोनाइजेशन को अपनाना पड़ेगा अंडर एनी सर्कमस्टांसिस थैंक यू I, I just want to add to one thing because he brought up the Karna issue. Um, we all need to, as he said, Hindu rehna hai, to decolonize to hona hi padega. We need decolonization. For Mahabharat, we definitely need decolonization. Take my word for it. We do. Only then the itihas will become more relevant and we'll understand what we were. Sure, rightly put by both the panelists. And uh, certainly for discourses like these to reach university spaces and students who are day to day in their lives also struggling with this sort of coloniality and the decoloniality factor. I suppose therefore these conversations become uh, vital to happen. And uh, that is what uh, this platform and this um, event was about. And I suppose uh, if time permits, we can have a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you for your talk. Ma'am, my question was from you. Ma'am, Bhishma Pitama ko aapne ek pioneer of Raj Dharm ki tarah portray kiya hai. Aur Krishna Dharm ke pioneer ki tarah aa rahe hain. To jab Krishna Arjun ko Swadharm se khaa rahe hain. Aur wo keh rahe hain ki Dharm Pandavo ke paksh mein hain. Aur Bhishma Pitama Kaurvo ki taraf se lad rahe hain. To Bhishma Pitama ka Raj Dharm adharm kiyo nahi hai. That's that's an excellent question. Or is it itihas janna or samajna atyanta avashak hai? We learn in Mahabharat that we all go through dharma sankats. And solving a dharma sankat is actually not at all easy. Let's come to Bhishma's character. Yeah? Does he not know right from the very beginning that Pandavas are on the side of dharma? He always does. In fact, that is why after the Yudha ends and he's on the bed of arrows, or Krishna says to Yudhishthir, you meet with your father, talk to him, 
Yudhishthir is like, I show him his, my, how do I show him my face? I have, I have been the reason that so much destruction has happened. Anyways, finally he goes. And what do you know what Bhishma Pitama says? Because Krishna tells Bhishma that he is afraid to face you. And Bhishma Pitama says, for a Raja, for a Kshatriya, it doesn't matter who is on the opposing side. If the opponent is adharmi, be it a guru, be it a brother, be it a son, be it a father, it is the responsibility of the Raja to punish him and kill him. You are on the side of dharma. We all have known that. So at that point also, Bhishma Pitama always knows that dharma is with the side of the Pandavas. So then what happened? Why did they not fight from the Pandavas side? That is the question, right? What, is, what was his dharma at that point in time? Now let's understand this. When we say dharma sankat, what are we saying? That we all play different roles in life. yeah, And we have a dharma associated to the different entities that we are a part of. Just say some, in our kutumba, we have a putra dharma, putri dharma, pita dharma, mata dharma, all of that. In the organization, we have a sevak dharma, employee dharma. yeah. In the Rashtra, we have a citizen dharma. Ye sara hai. Now, what was the dharma sankat that Arjun was faced with? What was the dharma sankat Arjun was faced with? Kutumba dharma versus Kshatriya dharma, dharma itself, right? That was his issue. What is it with Bhishma Pitama? Let's understand this well. Of course, Kutumba dharma, but the other is also his sevak dharma. Okay. Who was he? He was the Senapati of the uh, Kauravas, right? Now think of it from our perspective. We have to say that it's very easy why did he not go on the side of the Pandavas? There was one other character in Itihas who actually went on the other side, the side of Dharma. Vibhishan. Right? And Vibhishan, what do we say? Dharka Bhedi Lanka Dhai. To somebody who actually went to the side of dharma. Right? Unko hum aise bolte hai. Bhishma Pitama ko bolte hai, aray kyo dharma ke side nahi gai? Aap socho. So this should make you understand how difficult solving a dharma sankat is. Coming back to, back to Bhishma Pitama, let's take the example of our army. We have a general in the army. Okay? We have a fight with say some other country. Say we are the aggressors for a wrong reason. What would we as citizens of Bharat expect our general to do? Sit and discuss the morality or his dharma towards his rashtra. For whatever reason, the war is fought. What would we expect from our army? Jump on the side of the other side? So you see, kaise chakra mein fase huye the Bhishma? अगर वो इस तरफ आते तो आज हम उनको कहते ट्रेटर टू हिज ओन पीपल राइट वो उस तरफ है तो वी सर अरे धर्म के साइड नहीं गए सो व्हाट इज राइट व्हाट इज रॉन्ग इट्स एक्चुअली अ वेरी वेरी डिफिकल्ट डिसीजन एंड दैट इज व्हाई दैट इज वेयर कृष्णा कम्स इन ही सेज यस इट इज डिफिकल्ट बट देन हाउ डू यू एंश्योर यू मेक द मोस्ट ऑप्टिम राइट और रॉन्ग इज नॉट द प्रश्न the prashna is what is the most optimum decision at that point in time and how will you know it the only way to know it is by becoming extremely objective not driven by emotions bhishma pitama tries very hard to stop the war antatak in fact after he has fallen and after 10 days of the war when karna comes to him he says are abhi bhi afsar hai jaane do don't fight but karna says now it's too late right he also tries different ways of ensuring Duryodhan stops the war. He says, I will not kill the Pandavas. Duryodhan is like, doesn't matter. We are, hum hai na, hum maar denge, aap ladai karo. But even when he, Bhishma Pitama is fighting, he's fighting to the best of his abilities, right? So that is why understanding what is a Dharma Sankat and still taking what is the most optimum, which he thought his role required to do, he did. With complete clarity, knowing which side he was fighting for and knowing that this is the side this is going to lose. So that also requires a very deep understanding of dharma, right? Right or wrong, we can judge to kar sakte hai. But imagine if you are in his shoes, what would you do? Thank you. Very well articulated, Thank you. We'll have two quick questions. Radhe, Radhe. 
my question is to once again Ami ma'am and JSI Deepak sir as well. Very brief. Let me give a context that the very first day I entered the Delhi University and I'm from Miranda House, my professor said Ravan was a better husband than Ram. Point one. Point two, the uh, Hindu Society's discussion forum, they bring up this post about regarding the Shambhukvat and relating it to uh, Rohit Vemula's death, which was a suicide. Your so, question, please. The question is how to counter this narrative in the campus because being brutally honest we have to uh, we have to be concerned about our grades first and second thing that these uh, things are being undertaken in the campus what is the root of this uh, thing thank you thank so i think it was uh, miranda house only hua kya tha One of the reasons I go to college campuses more when I accept an invitation is because I know where the battleground is. The battleground is in the future. You are the minds of the future. So thought control is what is happening at this stage. So patriarchy pe kisi ko bhashan bazi dena tha. C tha matlab latch, I mean they, uh, they latched onto this BP, Brahmin patriarchy. So one ladki, brilliant girl, independent girl and gutsy says, why only Brahmin patriarchy? Why, why, aren't, why aren't we opening it up? I think I got a DM on Instagram from the person. I don't know. Are you the person? Fantastic. So that's the person, right? Fantastic. That's the way to open the conversation. Jab tak ladai aapke ghar mein ho rahi hai, aap jeetenge, tab bhi aap haarenge. Take the fight to the other side. Now, I will say something that I said in the context of UCC and I'll say this very openly. मनुस्मृति के बारे में जो भी बात करना चाहता है तब तक आप बात नहीं करेंगे जब तक ओल्ड टेस्टमेंट की बात नहीं हो रही है कुरान की बात नहीं हो रही है क्रिश्चियनिटी की बात नहीं हो रही है और दी ओल्ड अवेस्था लेट्स टॉक अबाउट ऑल ऑफ दिस लेट्स टॉक अबाउट ऑल ऑफ दिस इफ अ पर्सन रिटायर्स फ्रॉम द पोस्ट ऑफ अ जज नो मोर कंटेम्प्ट अप्लाई सो नाउ आई स्पीक वी वेट कॉल ड्यूरिंग द कोर्स ऑफ आर्ग्यूमेंट इन इन सेंसिटिव मैटर सर सबरीमला that all the evils traceable in the Indian subcontinent with respect to Jati must be exclusively traced only to Hinduism was said from the bench by a member of the bench. They said this. I was a 32 year old, uh, year old then. I was awaiting my turn and I wasn't sure if my turn would come. So I said, so I just kept my mouth shut. The point is this. These statements are being made because everybody knows that they'll, the rest of them will be protected by the catch-all defense in this country, secularism, from examination of their books. The day you actually have a comparative conversation on every aspect of treatment, of human treatment by every book, so to speak, we will see where this goes. That conversation hasn't happened. This does not mean that there is nothing for us to look into and introspect. And please understand, there are two parts to it. These are two aspects. Now, when this conversation happens, I'll tell you, and, and thanks for raising this issue, law schools may, these days when people come and talk and they start talking about political science, I know for a fact that they start with jati, straight off. The conversation is jati. The conversation is gender. And that's because you have no response mechanisms. And this is a boxing match where you're being told, take the punch and tie your hands to your back because you don't get to punch back citing their material at all. Because the moment you do that, Phobia becomes the next weapon. That's one of the reasons that people, some of us have to take the risk and resort to disruptive interventions to hold the mirror to the other side. When the conversation doesn't go beyond that, then automatically hypocrisy is exposed. And I think one of your neighboring institutions that did that fantastically when they canceled me, right? Brilliant institution, apparently known for celebrating free speech, but I think it's free speech in the Protestant style. So. I was specifically told, no, no, no. Free speech is permissible as long as you're bashing yourself, but not otherwise. That is how it works. This hypocrisy can be called out only by using truth and knowledge and having the vertebracy to speak it, but with a civil tone, staying within the bounds of the law. It's a tightrope walk. You should know how to do it. By definition, every Hindu must become a lawyer when it comes to this. There's no other option.
Sorry, I'm going to say one last thing, just one thing. All the uh, examples you gave, right? How is it that they are able to weaponize these topics against us? Now, if somebody reads the Valmiki Ramayan, they will themselves know how hollow this allegation is. Are aap kaun hote ho Ravan ko husband, acha husband bolne wale mandodari se pucha kya? What does what does Mandodari herself say at the death of Ravan? Go read it, right? Why are we becoming targets of such hate or whatever, such wrong narratives? Because we do not read our itihas. So know the truth, read your itihas is what I will end with.